as uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the service and the video that we just saw, today, November 7th, uh, 2021, is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. Every year we are reminded during the month of November. to think about our fellow brothers and sisters who are suffering in many parts of the world. It's nice to have a reminder like that, but like how we talk about Thanksgiving, every day should be a day of Thanksgiving. Same way, every day we should be remembering our brothers and sisters who are suffering for Jesus Christ. Uh, the Bible actually commands us to do that. Uh, the text we're gonna be looking at today is Hebrews chapter 13 and verse three, just one verse. It's page 1877 in the church Bibles here. Page 1877, Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 3. Here's the individual believer's responsibility to other believers, especially those who are being persecuted because of their faith in Jesus. Continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison, and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. That's the command. Continue to remember. Continue to remember the persecuted church, the persecuted believers. So let's pray, ask God to uh, open our eyes to see the cost that some of our brothers and sisters are paying, even as I proclaim this message. So, let's look to the Lord. Father, today I pray that uh, through your spirit, you will do a deep work in all of our hearts to see the cost, the high cost that is unimaginable for us, that people are paying gladly because they bear the name of being a child of God, a follower of Jesus. Father, would you please strip us from those things that we pursue that have no eternal significance. Open our eyes to see the serious call we have, this call of remembering continually what your people are going through <coughs> in many places of the world. Speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> now Forbes magazine on January 13th, 2021, this very year, posted an article titled, One in Eight Christians Worldwide Live in Countries Where They May Face Persecution. The article was written by a Dr. Eulina Okab. She's a human rights advocate and the author and co-founder of the Coalition of Genocide Response. She works mainly on the topic of genocide with specific focus on the persecution of ethnic and religious minorities all over the world. The article she wrote was based on the annual watch list report posted by Open Doors International. They're a non-government uh, organization that advocates on behalf of the persecuted church all over the world. Let me read some parts of the article that she wrote, which she mainly, she drew in information from the Open Doors article. This is what uh, she says. The World Watch list assesses 50 countries where Christians face the most severe types of persecution. The newly published data reveals that during the reporting period between October 2019 and September 2020, more than 340 million Christians were living in countries where they might suffer high levels of persecution and discrimination because of their faith. Among this number, 309 million Christians were living in countries where they might suffer very high or extreme levels of persecution. As Open Doors emphasizes, that's one in eight worldwide, one in six in Africa, two out of five in Asia, and one in 12 in Latin America. Open Doors research identified that during the reporting period, 
4,761 Christians were killed for their faith. 4,488 churches or Christian buildings were attacked. 4,277 Christians were unjustly arrested, detained or imprisoned. 1,710 Christians were abducted for faith-related reasons. On average, every day 13 Christians are killed for their faith, which is about 300 plus a month. 12 churches or Christian buildings were attacked. 12 Christians are unjustly arrested, detained or imprisoned, and five Christians are abducted for faith-related reasons. In the 21st century, it is still not possible to practice religion or the beliefs safely. Now, one may argue about the accuracy of these numbers, exact numbers, but one thing is clear whether we agree on the exact number or not. One thing that is clear is persecution of believers in Jesus Christ all over the world is on the rise. That is a reality. That is a reality. Even Forbes, a secular magazine, recognizes this truth. And according to this article, for the 20th consecutive year, North Korea ranks number one as the world's worst persecutor of Christians. Here's what the article says. Being a Christian in North America is a death sentence. If not killed, Christians are taken to labor camps as political criminals. Kim Jong-un Kim Jong -un is reported to have expanded the system of prison camps in which an estimated 50 to 70,000 Christians are currently imprisoned. Just reading that breaks my heart. And I know it breaks yours as well. Article goes on to describe this about Nigeria. In Nigeria, men and boys are particularly vulnerable to being killed. The women and children they leave behind are often displaced in formal camps, face sexual violence, and are even at risk of abduction and forced marriage. And here's a note about China. The Communist Party limits whatever it perceives as a threat to its rule and ideology. Thousands of churches have been damaged or closed. In some parts of China, children under the age of 18 aren't allowed to attend church, part of the country's efforts to stunt future growth. While China is ranked 17th as a place where Christians are subjected to high levels of persecution, the situation of all religious groups in China is dire and has been deteriorating over the recent years. And we know that because Karen, who will be coming to on December 5th to speak to us, she was forced out of China ministering to the Uyghur people. So it's not just Christians, but all, all religious groups. Considering the current trends of persecution in China, it is expected that China will soon be topping the open doors charts and competing with North Korea as the worst place to live as a Christian. I'm not sure if you're aware of this. The Chinese communist government is coming out of the new translation of the Bible. I don't know if it's fully published yet, but parts of it have been published in textbooks. The same textbooks that talk about ethics and law. This is one example of what they have done. You're familiar, if you're a Christian, of John chapter 8. Here's this woman caught in adultery. She's brought before Jesus. So they ask, what do we do? The Old Testament law said if someone is caught, they need to be stoned to death. So what does Jesus say? The one who's without sin, cast the first stone. So everyone leaves. And then Jesus in chapter, in, in verse 11 says, then neither do I condemn you. He tells this woman, go now and leave your life of sin. Yes, I forgive you. But that forgiveness should cause you to desire to be more holy. You know how the New Communist Version reads? That same verse, verse 11. When the crowd disappeared, Jesus stoned the sinner to death, saying, I too am a sinner, but if the law could only be executed by men without blemish, the law would be dead. Jesus stoned the sinner, Jesus confessing, I too am a sinner. Folks, that's not translation, that's corruption. That's corruption. Remove Jesus' sinless nature. Remove the substitutionary atonement. Remove the concept of forgiveness and grace. The idea is no one can break the laws of the government. 
Chinese Communist government in context. This idea eliminates the idea, eliminates the thought of a transcendent God, which means no higher authority in the government. So you can see, not only is there physical persecution, but more ideologies that are anti-God, anti-Bible are being formulated and propagated as the truth. I don't need to mention about what is going on in Afghanistan. Terrible, terrible. So in the light of all this that is happening in our time, this is not something that's 200 years ago or 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago. This is right now. In the light of that, Hebrews 13 and verse 3. It's a good text to look for this morning. It's good for us to be reminded of our responsibilities towards other persecuted believers. We're so caught up with our own issues. We cannot live like that. In fact, this is a command, by the way. This is not a suggestion. This is not, I want you to think about it. This is an abiding command for the New Testament Christian, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, who commanded to obey. There is a world outside of our four walls. Our fellow brothers, our family members, paying a very high price for just naming the name of Jesus little background about this book of Hebrews before we get in here. The letter to the Hebrews was written to encourage believers to hold on to Jesus as well as encourage unbelievers who are thinking about Jesus. Don't turn back. Come, take the next step. Take the final step. By faith, embrace this Jesus as your Savior. That The writer tries to uh, convince both these groups of this by explaining the supremacy of Jesus. That Jesus is a supreme being. He talks about how Jesus is superior to angels. How Jesus is superior to Moses. To Joshua. To the Old Testament priesthood. And his sacrifice is the once for all sacrifice. The greatest sacrifice that will bring people out of the chains of sin and darkness and judgment. To forgiveness and eternal life. In the light of who he is and what he has done. The writer keeps calling people, hold on to Jesus, come to Jesus. He uses these two words over a dozen times, let us, let us, let us. In the light of who Jesus is, in the light of what he has done, let us press forward. Let us hold on to him. Let us, let us, let us. From chapter 10 on, he's calling people, don't turn back. He gives a whole chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, of how people endured Suffering because they named the name of Jesus. Then he concludes in chapter 13. He's kind of pulling things together. He, he gives this particular instruction about remembering persecuted believers. Notice how he starts verse 1. Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. That's a general call to love one another. And then he narrows that love one another to certain areas. Within context, verse 2, he talks about show hospitality to strangers. That word hospitality has the idea of loving strangers. Love all. Keep on loving your brothers and sisters. And then love the strangers. Open your homes. To minister even to people whom you don't know about but they need shelter they need your ministry open the home open the home and then in verse 3 he calls believers to go out of their homes to minister to people verse 2 hospitality open your home verse 3 go out to people who are suffering in prison and those who are mistreated outside of prison too. Those who are suffering because they bear the name of Jesus Christ. It could be in your home. It could be from your extended family members. It could be society. It could be the government. Whatever, whatever the sphere you find yourself in, go minister. Go outside your home, outside the comfort of your four walls and reach out and minister to people who 
who are being persecuted for their faith. The command is to remember them. That word remember has the idea of remembering with an intent to act. Not just a mental ascent, you know, oh yeah, I remember them. It's about, I remember them with the thought of, I need to do something. I need to do something. It calls for active help, no matter the cost. One commentator puts it this way. He defines it as help involved in supplying their physical needs and providing them with moral support, even at the risk of exposing oneself to possible confinement. Because in those days, you help someone in prison, you're identifying with them and their cause. Guess what that means? You're a marked person now. Don't shy away because there's a threat for you. That's kind of the idea. And the very fact that that word remember is in the present tense, if you look at the text, continue to remember, tells us that this should be a part of our daily Christian living. I know once a year, it's great, but this should be every day. I should remember my brothers, my sisters, for whom Christ died, who are united with Jesus by faith. I need to remember them. What can I do? We'll talk about what we can do a little later, but that's kind of the idea. Notice those two phrases. Those two phrases. As if you were together with them in prison, and then as if you yourselves were suffering. That first one, as if you were together with them in prison, meaning the idea is those days when someone is in prison, they'll be chained, sometimes to a guard or to a wall. He says, I want you to remember those who are in prison as if you were chained there. Substitute. Think of yourself being there. And then, as if you yourselves were suffering. Some translations have it as, as if you yourselves were in the body. Some take it as it refers to the body of Christ. It is true, it's the body of Christ, but I think the idea here is more of you're in the physical body. What you're going through, just try to understand the pain that you're going through. What the writer wants us to do is he wants us to enter into the suffering of the suffering Christian. He wants us to get into it. That's what the Lord did, didn't he? He just didn't stay in heaven and pronounce forgiveness. He entered into this broken world. He entered into our pain. He entered into our suffering. And that's why he's an empathetic high priest. He feels it. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul wasn't persecuting Jesus. He was persecuting the followers of Jesus, but Jesus I feel the pain. And one of my followers are hurting. I feel. I weep with those who weep. That's the kind of God we have. Not a distant God. He just lets everything in motion, then you know, hands off. God of the Bible does not use a hands off approach. He is involved in our joys as well as in our pains and sorrows. That's what the author is calling us to do. I want you to enter into your suffering. Think of yourself being in prison as they were. See, those days, prisons were cramped, cold, dark, and filthy. And those who guarded prisoners were often very cruel. They were always expecting bribes. The hardest part was this. Those in prison were not given any clothes or food. It was up to their friends or other kind of benefactors who would give them food. That was the condition. And the world was and is never friendly to believers. Who would have to minister to these people? Other believers. So the writer is saying, you cannot not do something. You cannot just have a hands-off approach. Even if it costs you, this is your duty. This is the second command, the greatest command, love your neighbor in application in that particular area. You cannot just stay aloof and say, I didn't know anything about it. God is saying, you cannot plead ignorance. You're called to actively get involved in their suffering because you could be in that same position. What would you expect? What would you expect? 
Would you want people to... Imagine you're suffering. You don't have anything. And you know fellow believers elsewhere, they're just piling treasure upon treasure upon treasure and they're seeking more and more. How would you feel? And yet sometimes that's, what, that's how we live. Let this message go deep into our hearts to bring about some concrete changes in our lives. This is not just information I want to transmit. The Holy Spirit must transform us from inside out. We must enter into the sufferings of other believers. The early church stepped up ministering to people who were suffering. In fact, by the second century, the kind of love that believers had, especially for those who were in prison, became common knowledge. Listen to the words of one writer by the name of Lucian. He lived in the second century. Lucian was not a Christian, and he often ridiculed religious practices. Yet notice what a glowing review he gave about Christians who helped other believers in prison. This is what he writes. Everything that could be done they most devoutly did. They reference to the believers who were helping others. They thought of nothing else. Orphans and ancient widows might be seen hanging about the prison from break of day outside, trying to go in to minister. Their officials bribed the gaolers, that's the wardens, that's the people guarding the prison, to let them sleep inside with the prisoner. One of his own servants was put in prison. They would do all this just to go and give some company Elegant dinners were brought in. Their sacred readings were read to minister to those who are in prison. Another writer tells this, poor believers who did not have anything, they would sometimes with their family skip a meal or two so that they can take that food and go give to those in prison. Can you imagine that? They would skip eating so that someone else can eat. We often talk about, I want the power of the early church, but we're not willing to commit ourselves to following the path that the early believers took. They gave up. There is a cost if you want to live for Jesus. There is a cost. If you're not willing to pay the cost, you might claim to be a follower of Jesus. I know him, but on that day he'll say, I never knew you. Because this is the heart of God to identify himself with sinners and to enter into those who are suffering. That's the kind of love the writer of Hebrews is calling God's people to display. Actually, these people are already doing it. Because if you go back two chapters to Hebrews 10, a couple of chapters, Hebrews 10, let me read from verse 32. He's already told them, you, you're doing this. And now in chapter 13, he says he wants them to continue doing it because as persecution rises, it's hard to do this. Look at verse 32. He says, remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you became a new Christian, you were bubbling with joy and commitment. When you endured in a great conflict full of suffering, sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, notice, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison. There it comes. And joyfully, underline that, highlight that word, joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So, here's the application. Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. He's encouraging them. Even when they came, because you identified with another believer who was in prison, the authorities came after you. Oh, so you too are a believer. You're going to lose all of this. They said, take it. Take it. They didn't clutch to their possessions. It was not a reluctant thing. They joyfully accepted the confiscation of their property. Here we lose one little thing. One little earthly thing. We moan and groan and complain. We grasp it so tight. They lived with an open hand. 
So he says, you've been doing this. What? Don't throw away this confidence. Why are you doing all of this? Because you know something greater is there. Don't throw away your confidence. When you're persecuted, you will feel like giving up. What's the point in following Jesus if this is going to be my life? That's a very narrow perspective because all we see is the here and now. We don't see the then and after that. Eternal joy that awaits us. We just focus on today. How can I be happy today? What fulfills me now? The Christian life is not about fulfillment in the here and now. It. God does give us good things to enjoy. God does bless us with so many things. Yet, if our hearts find their treasure in those things, then we cannot be slaves of Jesus Christ. You cannot be a slave of God and money. You cannot. Don't think you're the only exception. You cannot. So the writer wants them to hold on to this confidence. So he says, keep on helping. Keep on remembering. Keep on doing it. I don't want you to stop. Don't fear the cost. Don't fear man who only has control over your soul, who control over your body. Fear Jesus who has power both over your body and soul. It's a beautiful illustration of this truth, a scriptural illustration, how God's people were not afraid to identify themselves with those who are suffering no matter the cost. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1. I'll give you the page number. Here's Paul himself is writing about this one fellow by the name Onesiphorus. In 2 Timothy 1, let me give you the page number here in a minute. Page 1851. 1851. Let me read verses 15 through 18. 2 Timothy 1, 15 through 18. You know, Paul writes, this is his last letter. He is in prison. He's in prison. He's never going to come out. He's writing from prison here. Last letter. You know that everyone in the province of Asia, that's modern day Turkey, has deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. People abandoned because of fear of persecution. But there's this man, Onesiphorus. He says, May the Lord show mercy. Why? Because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. What day? The day Jesus returns. You know very well in how many things he helped me in Ephesus. This man was not afraid to identify himself as a friend of Paul because you can imagine, oh, you're a friend of Paul. Now we got our we got our focus on you. So you're going to be joining him in prison as well. So that could cause someone to back off. But Onesiphorus said, no, no, no. I'm going to be with Paul. I'm going to minister to him. He searched hard. He made it a point. I must identify myself and do whatever I can to minister to God's people who are suffering for the faith. And what a comfort that brought to Paul. That's why he put that in the text for us. It's a comfort. What an encouragement it brings to us as well. That's the idea. Hebrews 13 says, feel the suffering of other believers. Feel it. As if you yourself are going through that suffering. And that feeling should move us to action. We are to do whatever we can to help them. The situation was reversed. That's exactly what we would want. We'd appreciate any help people give. And speaking of help, I want to give you three practical ways. Three practical ways how we can put this command to, to action. Hebrews 13. How are we to remember those who suffer for the faith? Number one, through our physical presence, where possible. Through our physical presence. We already saw from Hebrews 10. You were there with those in prison. 2 Timothy 1, Onesiphorus, what he did, that believers offered help through their presence. In our day and age, we too must take time to physically be with suffering believers. Obviously, the suffering people go through here is different from 
other places. But still, believers still here are suffering too for their faith. Physical presence does bring a lot of comfort. When think about whatever your political views are, just put them all aside for a moment. God is bringing refugees here. Okay. We can minister to them. We can minister. Some of these refugees are believers. Obviously, they take a higher priority, but the Bible talks about evangelism, mission field. Even people of other faith, too, we can show love to them. We can show this is how believers, followers of Jesus live. We care. We want to enter into your suffering. We want to do what we can to help you. The sad thing is, people yell and scream, even professing to be Christians about refugees, but you don't see them as the mission field. Go into all the world, said Jesus, but he's bringing the world to us. We fail to see that. Because we are so focused on our security, our pleasures, us, us, us. Never seeing the big picture. Sovereign God bringing people so we can minister the gospel. We are the eyes, we are the hands, we are the feet, we are the mouths through which Jesus ministers to them. We cannot afford turn our backs and our eyes. So physical presence is one way through which we can minister to suffering believers through your physical presence. Second, through your finances. Our finances. We understand from Paul's letter, again, I want to go back. Paul's, another letter in Philippians. In Philippians, he talks about how the Philippian church, he's in Rome, first imprisonment, He's in Rome and in Philippians chapter 2, page uh, 1825. The Philippian church is far away. But from there, they send a man by the name Epaphroditus to physically help Paul through his presence as well as financially they send money because Paul would need money. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. He says, but I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also, notice, your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. So the Philippine church said, you know what? All of us cannot go to Rome. We'll send one person. He can still go and serve physically, but also financially. Where we cannot go, our finances can go. And then from Philippians 4.18, we understand it was not just physical presence that needs also refers to money. I have received full payment, Paul says in chapter 4 verse 18, and I have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. What the Philippine church did for Paul while he was suffering, just that's a sacrifice. He's bringing this Old Testament picture of how when a sacrifice is pleasing to God, he's drawing that analogy here. He says, that's how your act is pleasing. So when we support suffering believers with our money, folks, that's the text says that here, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. We exist to please God. So when you think about the persecuted, suffering believers, and that thinking leads you to acting, understand this, God is pleased. God is pleased. In our time, we support people like missionaries or ministries that are in these places. They are there, hands on. We support them through our finances because all of us cannot go to all the places. But God has designed such a way that we provide what we can. In addition to prayers, money. That's one reason. To support missions. Because at the end of the day, it's not just physically being there. It's not just, you know, giving some money. Planting churches. So there can be strong churches there. That's why we support missions and we should be committed to supporting even more as the Lord enables us. So two ways so far we've seen 
how we can remember, continually remember the persecuted church. One, suffering believers through our physical presence where possible. Two, through our finances. And third, and most important, through our prayers. Through our prayers. We find the early church praying for suffering believers. Acts 12, church prayed for Peter. Paul himself frequently asks other believers in his letters to pray for suffering believers, to pray for himself if he's suffering. He prays for other believers who are suffering. And he, he talks about, you know, pray while I'm in prison that I might be bold in proclaiming the gospel, Ephesians 6, verses 19 through 20. In fact, in Philemon 1, chapter 1 and verse 22, he says, pray that I may be restored to you soon. <coughs> Meaning, pray for my release. Pray for my release. So, in our time as a church, when we gather together, we can remember the persecuted church in prayers. We used to do that before COVID came and we kind of put a stop to congregational prayer. We start resuming it soon. But when we meet for times of fasting and prayer, we pray for the persecuted church. When we pray, when we meet for our weekly prayer, midweek prayer, we pray for the persecuted church. That should be part of our constant prayers as a church then as individuals too, we must cultivate this habit of praying every day. One way you can do that, Pierre sends out an email every morning with a Bible portion to read and you'll find there persecuted nations. Just pray for them. It's an easy way. This was designed deliberately for you to remember to pray for persecuted church, persecuted believers every day. There was some thought put into those emails. We must pray, suffering believers, that they'll experience God's presence. That's the main thing they need, experiencing God's presence. Because with God's presence comes God's peace. We must plead with God to pour out His mercies to them for deliverance. For all their needs to be met. For their faith to remain steadfast. For God to bless their evangelistic efforts. We must pray. We must pray diligently. We need to pray for their persecutors so they too can come to saving faith. Don't ever underestimate the power of prayer. With prayer, we move the arm that moves the world. It's as simple as that. But also, in our prayers, we should also be praying, Lord, how much more can I be doing? That's important. In Matthew 9, if you remember, Jesus talks about, you know, the, there's this great need for workers. Pray that the Lord would raise more workers. And then in chapter 10, he sends them out as those workers. In other words, you become part of the solution. You just don't pray, God, raise others. God, Lord, in what way can I be involved? A lot of times, we are part of the solution of the prayers we're asking God to accomplish. We must be willing to do what it takes. So ask God, Lord, what more can I do? Convict me in those areas where I need to be convicted so I can live even more purposefully. That should be our prayers. And when an opportunity arises, especially if it's, we cannot go physically, but we can, even if it's here, we can go physically, but there's a financial need. Folks, let us be generous. Let us live with open hands. Let us joyfully give so others can be blessed. Let's joyfully give. Our dollars still go a long way in many places. That's why it is very important to cultivate a sacrificial mindset. Some early Christians starved so others could eat. What can I say about us? We must give up more of our earthly pursuits so that our money can be a blessing to hurting believers who are faithful to Jesus, despite the suffering. You lose a husband, then you go back to that same place. Some of you know Graham Staines in India. When he and his boys were burned, many countries, including America, offered them refuge. Gladys and her daughter, 14-year-old daughter at that time. What do they do? They go back to the very same place, build a hospital to serve people. It's not humanly possible. Work of the Holy Spirit. We should enter into that kind of 
a mindset. Lord, use me. How can I? How can I live that kind of a life? Help me. Blind my eyes to the temporary and bind it to eternity. Because right now, Father, my eyes are bound to the temporary and blind to the eternal things. So, Father, convict me. Should be our cry. Open my eyes. Open my eyes. Because this is love for others. A practical way. And this kind of a sacrificial generosity we saw pleases the Lord very much. Pleases the Lord. So three practical ways. Through our physical presence, where possible, through our finances, and through faithful prayer. And when we practice these truths, I tell you there's at least three benefits. I'm going to close with it. Three benefits. Number one, we please the Lord. That's the most important thing. We exist to bring pleasure to God. Jesus, Jesus himself clearly said, caring for those in prison, helping those who are suffering for the sake of the gospel is equivalent to caring for him. Matthew 25. <coughs> Verses 35 and 36 this is what Jesus says. For I was hungry, familiar I said, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. That's Hebrews 12, verse 13, verse 2, verse 1, verse 3. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. I understand he's talking more specifically about what happens in the end times, but the principle applies. A cup of cold water. Jesus said in chapter 10, Matthew, you can remember it's for me. In verse 37, and the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, the king of the nations, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, evangelists, those who spread the gospel, whatever, but extension, all of you, you did for me. Praise is God. We please the Lord. That's benefit number one. Number two, we become bolder in evangelism. We become bolder in evangelism. You know, when we hear about these faithful believers, amidst all this suffering, standing firm, there's conviction. Lord, I got to do much more better here. Here I'm keeping my mouth closed because I kind of feel ashamed. I look like the odd person out. I don't want to be the one that's sticking out. Onesiphorus, Paul says he was not ashamed. It's important, we're not ashamed of Jesus. We're not ashamed. And we see them who are not ashamed that encourages us. Philippians 1 again, verses 12 through 14. Paul says how his imprisonment and how his suffering and his steadfastness during the suffering encouraged others to boldly proclaim the gospel. Listen to me, Philippians 1 verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me, Paul is in prison. What has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. Instead of sitting and crying, poor me, look at what is happening to me. He says, look at what God is accomplishing through the suffering of mine. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. I'm here in jail because I proclaim the gospel of Jesus. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters, it doesn't say I've become more fearful, have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul's boldness in witnessing for Jesus while in prison encouraged others to be bold and start sharing the gospel. So when we enter into the suffering of the persecuted church, when we think about suffering believers, we will not only please the Lord, but we also become more bold in our evangelism. These people are losing their lives. That's not our case. At max, they might misunderstand us, or even they might cut off the relationship. So be it. What's at stake here is their eternal destiny, not our earthly relationships. There's far bigger thing that is involved here, a soul. Third, we become less worldly. The more you continue to remember the persecuted church, 
the less and less you're going to become attached to worldly things. You see, we often don't think too much about the suffering believers because it comes at the cost. How so? The more we think about them, the more we think about how it's so little, they're so faithful, it convicts us because our lifestyle is filled with so many material pursuits, we feel guilty. And we don't want to feel guilty because we don't want to change. It's our problem. We want to keep con conviction at a healthy distance. We just don't want God to convict us too much. Just what I'm comfortable with. Out of sight, out of mind. So you know what? You don't think about it. You don't think about it. But when we frequently remember suffering believers, these two things happen. One, we'll be moved to do something for them. And two, as we're moved to do something for them, we'll slowly start losing our grip on those material things that we keep clutching to. Once we start seeing what matters really in life, our grip on the temporary things seem, not seem, will start loosening more and more. We will want to help those who are suffering. We will not cling to our things and we will not be pursuing as if money and fame is the ultimate thing. Sickening pursuit. That's not the characteristic of a believer. That's the seed that is sown on rocky places. The deceitfulness of riches. Acts 2.45 says, the early believers sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. They sold property and possessions. Acts chapter 2 verse 45. Keep in mind, the early church was full of Jewish converts. So when they came to Christ, the community would cut them off. Like an Amish type of picture today. Once you get cut off from the community, there's financial loss. So people are suffering. And to top it off, there was a famine. So the early church stepped up. Those who had, they said, you know what, that property that I thought I'd leave it for generations, it doesn't matter. Today, some people say, like, oh, I have it for a rainy day. Today it's pouring and people are soaking. Their homes are flooded. You're keeping something for a rainy day? No, give it now. That's what the scriptures are telling, not me. They sold it. Elsewhere it says, no one claimed anything was their own. Meaning, I may have my name on it, but that's not mine. That's God's. I'm a steward. And God wants me to pass it on to those who are hurting. I will want to pass it on. I want to. I want to. The Philippian church, Paul says, begged him for the privilege of sharing the needs of others. Begged him. And have to twist their arms. That happened because they first gave themselves to the Lord. See, the more we give ourselves to the Lord, the less and less we'll want to hold on to worldly things. The more we are captivated by love of Jesus, that's what the early church, they were captivated. So they said, in the light of who he is and what he has done, why would we not give ourselves completely for him and his causes? It was a love for Jesus that moved them to obey his commands, including his command to love the suffering church. So three personal benefits. We please God, number one. We become bolder in evangelism, number two. And we become less worldly. As individuals and as a church, I pray, I pray that God would move in our hearts to make a fresh commitment so that we will continually remember those who are suffering for the cause of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we are... We are guilty. I am guilty. Blind us, Lord, to the things that bind us to the temporary. Just help us open our eyes to see what it really means to live a life for your glory. Forgive us for our cold indifference. I don't know how else to put it, Father. We are so preoccupied, so consumed with wanting more and more and more of what we have enough of already.
Only your spirit can do this work. So I pray, Lord Jesus, through your spirit, we open ourselves to a convicting and continually converting work. As he points us to your glories, Lord Jesus, help us to continually remember, as you've commanded us to do so, those who are suffering. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege we have here. But help us to remember, Lord, the privilege comes a great accountability. One day we will have to give an account of what we have done with our time, talent, and treasures. Please, please. It's a fearful thing, Lord, to give an account. Let there be a new beginning in our lives today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.